Without further ado, um, Fran, who many of you, I hope, already know, she's a charming, wonderful person. And uh, <laughs> she grew up in New Jersey. And in reading about her background, uh, she often went to the Newark Museum as a child. And if you haven't been to the Newark Museum, it's still a wonderful museum. And she and her fellow students, she tells us, created pageants with paper mache animals and sewed costumes inspired by exhibits at the, at the Newark. And at the age of 10, she already fancied herself a modern artist. <laughs> and she and a friend of hers had a studio at that time in uh, her friend's uncle's apartment. Well, moving quickly ahead, she attends Bennington College, and uh, she's already a, a uh, visual artist, so she decides to become major in music, which she does. And uh, she graduates uh, in the early 60s and continues her studies in New York, earning two substantive degrees in textile design and an MA in NY, at NYU from art and uh, art education. And she tells us that as she uh, began her artistic career, she benefited greatly by two, as, for, as mentors by two other women artists, which is very important because as you know, often uh, the women artists are not as recognized as the uh, male artists are. So she did a brief period as a photorealist, uh, but then quoting uh, from Fran, uh, she changed direction. And to quote from her, she wanted to tell other stories through art. I needed to address other persistent questions. Who are we as human beings? What is our purpose in the universe? Why have we made such a mess of things? <laughs> what is art's pur purpose? Can I heal? Can, I, can art illuminate and thus transform us? And if you haven't had the chance to go uh, around the corner to the installation in Flanders Fields based on um, the train is done, you'll see that these words she just quoted, this is the epitome of, of what her goal was. The exhibit could not have happened without her partner, a Robert Black, who was seated over here and dressed in black. <laughs> and uh, I have Robert. And uh, he was very instrumental in the installation. Robert himself has a degree in architecture from the University of Minnesota. And he's a man of varied talents and interests. Uh, he has served on the board of the of, of, uh, the music, Compass Music Center in Brandon, and he's been president of the um, Sculpture Center um, in West Rutland. But he also um, has a wide ranging architectural practice. He's been a high school teacher, and um, he does installations, exhibits, drama, improvisation, and music performances. And you'll notice that his guitar is seated next to him, so I haven't even heard him play the guitar. So we have a real in store. So it's my real pleasure to welcome Fran and to thank her so much and Robert for doing this art installation and Fran for speaking today. Thank you very much. Thanks Bill and thank you Mary. It has been a joy to have my art installed here. Uh, I don't think an artist can ask for, for a better venue, a, a more lively and loving place in which to exhibit one's art and to make one's, one's voice heard publicly. It really has been a wonderful privilege. Uh, thank you, Robert, who, <laughs> the sine qua non, uh, up on ladders, making design for space, um, and uh, many other things, uh, technical assistant here, uh, preparing this presentation. Uh, I've called this talk from thought to thing. It's a little bit blunt. Uh, and the, the subtitle being how fervor and conviction are transformed into visual art. And it's more than just fervor and conviction, but uh, that's sort of the essence of it. 
And so I'm going to speak a little bit about that now. Um, uh, first of all, just to let you know what these letters, uh, this letter is and the envelope. Um, the, this is a letter that my dad wrote in probably 40, 43, 44, 45 from the Nuremberg trials. He was a journalist who covered the Nuremberg trials for the New York Times and the Associated Press. And at that time, we were back in the States as a young family. And uh, he wrote these letters to my mother. And they're, they're quite something describing how it was to sit in the, in the trials. Um, and uh, being a writer, the writing itself is very pungent. And one day, I will bring those letters forward. I found them in an envelope, uh, in a, in a uh, suitcase in the attic when we were moving out of the house. You know, mm -hmm. one of those moments where, oh, what's this suitcase? Oh my goodness. And my mother had saved the letters. And so uh, that's the envelope that, that accompanied that uh, particular letter. Um, so I thought and it's World War II. But still, there was that in my, in my background. Very, we were in Vienna after the war. Um, and uh, as a little child, I think I wrote something about it in the exhibition. Uh, as a very small child, I saw buildings that had been bombed and actually little uh, children uh, begging on the streets. And it was, you know, incomprehensible. So, so that's, you know, in, in, my, in my life and background. Um, so my, my talk will trace the arc of the making of the installation in Flanders Fields, a meditation on war, from the initial inspiration through the nuts and bolts creation in the studio to its completion on view in the museum here. Uh, my intention in making the work was twofold, to add my voice to those who wish for and dream of an end to war, and to honor those uh, who with courage and in good faith gave their service and their lives for the magnificent idea of peace on earth. As an artist, and even more as a teacher, I have wrestled to understand and thus explain the alchemy involved in creative expression. Things come to me. How to teach that? They may come as fully formed works of art, um, the means of their making embedded uh, in a mental image, or they are nagging vague things that demand attention and want to be birthed into the world as image or object. They don't leave you in peace until you take action. And then they take pleasure in being evasive. <laughs> they are lion, there are lions <coughs> guarding the gates of creativity. <laughs> That's the heroism involved that the artist uh, takes on. Um, I, marvel, I marvel that out of seemingly invisible processes, works of art emerge. Where there was nothing, now there is a charged object that takes on a life independent of me. The poet Pablo Neruda speaks of these things powerfully in his poem, La Poesia. We will share it with you now. And it was in that time, poetry came to find me. I don't know, I don't know where it came from, from winter or a river. I don't know how or when. No, there weren't voices. They weren't words or silence, but from a street. It called me from the boughs of the night. Suddenly, amongst the others, between violent fires or returning alone, it was there, faceless, and it touched me. I didn't know what to say. My mouth didn't know what to call it. My eyes were blind, 
and something was beating in my soul. A fever or lost wings. I just kept going, analyzing that burning, and I wrote my first vague line. Vague, no substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom, from which one knows nothing. And suddenly I saw the sky, uncovered and open, planets, throbbing plantations, the pierced darkness riddled by arrows, fire and flowers, the overpowering night, the universe. was a single image that sparked my desire to make a work that took up this very serious subject of war. I learned through newspaper accounts that fallen soldiers were being brought back from the Iraq war in the dead of night, secretly, so that we citizens would remain unaware of the scope of the tragedy. So this is, uh, this is a, that scene. I wanted in some way to express my own grief and pain. I looked for an image, for something that transcended the particular object of my grief, one that could speak to the fact of war, to the archetype of war. I wanted to portray the horror, the grief, the sadness through art. Um, I wanted to inspire others to contemplate war's ever-present specter in human history. I remember vividly walking on a street in 2009 or so uh, in Barcelona, lost in the question of how to make such a work come alive. I wrestled with how to move <coughs> from the invisible place of thought vision and feeling to the outer world of things, of expressive objects. It was then that the poem in Flanders Field found me. It became my template, my script, so to speak, a point of departure, a symbol, a catalyst, and an end point. This is an image of soldiers in the Afghanistan war who, are, who all were dead and uh, who all died in that war. So that configuration is something that was very much in my mind. Um, I saw in the theater of my imagination the wall of the fallen ones, the horizontal field of the poem, now made vertical, now a wall, like a wailing wall, a place for lamentation. I made in Flanders Fields in two places, in Barcelona, in the studio where I make etching, and in my Vermont studio, a space large enough for the sculpture. Uh, what happened? Push it again. Ah. So here are some, some etchings can see the relationship to the previous picture, the fallen ones. This is the studio in Barcelona. You'll see some proofs being made here, uh, also part of the, of the exhibition. Uh, the one hanging on the wall, it's very large, and uh, in the foreground. This is a close-up of one of the heads that was part of uh, the art. Here's another. These are copper plate etchings. Now we get to, I wasn't sure I wanted to give away the game, but Mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, this is how I made the sculptural wall of the fallen ones. I 
have started this way, these masks on canvas to give volume to the shapes. There you can see them cut the masks covered uh, with the plaster. This is Venetian plaster and you can see the the soldiers are kind of a washed in this a wash in this plaster. Coming along the exhibition taking shape here. And this is one of the red pieces. So, you know, as you work, there are variations that, that um, suggest themselves. And this was a particularly fecund uh, enterprise. Things kept exploding out of the, out of the idea. So, um, McRae's poem describes a, lands a landscape horrific and at the same time exquisitely beautiful, dark and light together. Larks fill the sky, singing oblivious of man's drama. So now, here are... This piece <coughs> is an etching. Uh, in two in two parts, the veil, there's a veil hanging in front of, of of the paper. These are the larks in the sky. Here's another version. This is a actually an etching on iron, and act, and I call it the larks ascending hmm. after the Elgar music. If you know it. Here's another version of the same image. In etching, you can ink the plate in various ways and, and it gives you a different image. Here's another variation with var various veils of images printed one on top of the other. And here's my assistant, Gabe, <coughs> Martyr at that time. She's making the very large birds. You'll see them hanging in the gallery. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're uh, coming into being. Here she is working outside because we used a toxic paint. Uh, and so she did the painting outside. And here they are drying in the barn. Oh, okay, so uh, his poem calls for blood red poppies, the field of, uh, the field of Flanders. They found themselves uh, in sculpture and in etching, fields being, uh, in, in a very real way, the metaphor for both two-dimensional and three-dimensional art. Mm -hmm. The flat canvas is a kind of field for the artist. Um, placing objects in space, uh, what sculpture, sculptors do is, is also taking into consideration the field. So here is, this was my only model for all those poppies you see in, in the etchings. I had this one, it was made out of made out of paper, and uh, it was my model. It was the only model. I kept turning it this way and that, and, mm -hmm. and frontally and so forth, and did a drawing on a plexiglass plate uh, with crayon. So the crayon um, then became lines that I etched with a, with a drill, a Dremel. And here you see it. Uh, more and more fully realized. At this point, you ink the plate and then you print it through the printing press. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Now we come to the three-dimensional poppies. 
this was this was sort of the model for all the poppies. Um, you can see that there's um, wire and so forth, and then covered with plaster and muslin and so forth. Uh, here they are all drying in the studio. <coughs> Okay, that gives you an idea of, of that. Um, what happened next, I could not have anticipated. In answer to a question, what about the women? Uh, the ancient drama by 5th century playwright Aristophanes floated to consciousness. I don't know how or from where. Lysistrata and her band of women clamored for attention. Um, here I'm showing you uh, Aubrey Beardsley's version of Lysistrata. Uh, she's kind of saucy and seductive, uh, which is um, certainly one of her very powerful aspects. Um, we have a solution. Uh, we have a solution. We have a way for the men to stop fighting this endless war. In this case, it was the Peloponnesian War. Uh, we shall withhold sexual privileges. Uh, the play was originally performed in 411 BCE uh, in a, uh, a humorous critique of society and uh, of the gender issues we seem still to be grappling with. Lysistrata literally means army disbander. <laughs> so, now I'm going to show you how uh, the, uh, this is not in the show, but it's part of it. Um, this was the um, version I made called, and now the women. Hmm. So considering the women in, in, the, in the whole picture, this was a, uh, an etching on a plexiglass plate. And this is another version of it. You can see <coughs> the wonderful variety within the process itself. <laughs> and this is the studio in Barcelona. You can kind of make out the plate is on the press bed, and my wonderful master printer, Virgili Barbara, is inking the plate. And when it's finished being inked, it goes through the press, and then you get what you get. It's one of those kind of things, sort of like firing clay. This was an iron plate, and you can barely make out the profile of a woman. And then it became more concretized. This is, a, this is the plexiglass plate. And then here's the print. And there's that bird that's ubiquitous throughout the the series. Here's another woman. That is the plate, and this is the print. Okay. So here you see these Lysistrata figures being made in the studio. You can see the wall of the fallen ones on the wall here. You can, you can kind of get the ambience. This piece was in the process of being made. Getting to be a lot of them. <laughs> here they are. And here I'm, I'm showing you the really, really crude um, beginnings of making the full figure. There's, a, there's one in the exhibition, one of the fallen soldiers. So he kind of looks like this as, uh, as I'm beginning to, to make the piece. And strangely enough, it's very improvisational. I kind of start and then keep working until it's, it comes into form. Thank <laughs> you.
I was very pleased that it kind of held together at that point. <laughs> um, there have been a number of showings of the piece, um, which I conceived as a sort of traveling show. It can expand or contract according to the space allotted. Each space seems to provide its own special aura and ambience, as with how it appears here uh, in, in this museum. Um, it joins with the objects, messages, and history of the war it emerged out of, World War I. In this space, it returns to its earthly origin, which I feel is such a perfect fit. Um, along the way, other artists have participated in the piece. Uh, there was a dance in the midst of the sculpture. Um, Eileen Blackman, if some of you know her, yeah. uh, is a choreographer and dancer, an actress um, who works um, with dancers, and she created a piece uh, at the, I believe it was at the Chaffee um, during that exhibition. And here you see what's so amazing was that she made a dance for, um, for professional dancers along with ordinary people. So there are these wonderful, sort of this wonderful mixture of how ordinary people move and, and how trained dancers move. There you can see uh, the piece. Eventually, four more pieces emerged. Ancient Greece was a continuing resource. I adapted the caryatids uh, who held up buildings. You know those marvelous women who this um, as symbols of feminine strength. And here you see them catching the soldiers as they fall. So here they are in the studio in the attitude of catching. So if I could have fit one of these sculptures into this gallery, the soldier who's falling would have been almost in her arms. So, um, there you see work in progress on one of these figures. <laughs> They're very crude in a way. They're almost, almost like sketches. Are those the carbon icons in the background? Sorry? Are those the carbon icons in the background? <sighs> You know, yes, the they are. They are. <laughs> I need to mention those two pieces you see on the left there appeared in the the, the opera, opera, opera company's opera. production of Carmen. Oh, yes, oh, sorry, but I can't help with the Everywhere I go, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just no, no. You, really, I'm glad you didn't let that go by. <laughs> uh, so, and here they they were on display. Wow. Where was that? This was at the Castleton, uh, Christine Price. Wow. Mm -hmm. And here you, uh, mounting those, I have some pictures of, of people up on ladders, Robert being one, and uh, other, others hoisting those, those figures with wires. So when we did it here, Robert had already had a rehearsal, shall <laughs> I <would> say. <laughs> um, Carolyn Corbett a former assistant who is now a filmmaker, created a film. Uh, oh, no, I meant, I meant to show you these, these images first. Uh, mm -hmm. Here we are. Yeah. So in the gallery, visitors are invited to write their own thoughts and place them in the midst of the exhibition. And I was just in there and uh, I'm very heartened to see so many messages that people wrote, and it'll be wonderful to read them, and you're invited to read them as well, and just place them back. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, just to give you that idea. People write the most incredible, a whole range of responses. Can you read that one down and part uh, of it? Something powerful here. It brings me back to Israel's western wall, leaving a prayer to God. There exists a world of prayer.
pro-war people who just don't get it, like uh, the something something. Lieutenant General. Ah, thank you. It's a bit like looking at ladies in waiting, all the women on death row, lined up like your heads. Uh, let's see, I can see this. Um, I can't read. That's what will become. Uh, and then I can't read what's, 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 yeah, what will, yeah, what will yeah. become. <coughs> anyway, you get the gist. Mm. Mm. So now, uh, now I'm, I'm going to show a film that was made by Carolyn Corbett. Uh, she, she borrows images from the installation, from the poet's words, and uh, adds a solemn layer of her own. The music in the film was composed and performed by Matthew Saldivar, whose parents taught at Middlebury College, and who graduated himself, graduated from Middlebury College decades ago. Um, in closing, I share this short film with you now. Go one more piece first. Okay. Oh, I forgot about this. Yes, I wanted to show you. This is uh, an opening of a show I just had in Barcelona of, of my etching. And it's, it was called Papers Volants, which, which means flying papers. And literally, uh, the, the etchings were, uh, were hung on clotheslines uh, so that you could see the paper and you could see the textures. Uh, and also, a kind of uniform, unifying theme was the, the same bird as I used in all of my Flanders it was one bird cut up many, many different times. In this case, we used old proofs. So each, each bird was, had a, a pattern on it that was from a previous work. And we had hundreds of them. So I just thought it would be fun to show how art kind of morphs through different phases and stages. And you use, you take some of the symbols and images that, that, that you worked with and place them elsewhere in other contexts. That's music. I think I'm giving this a talk here in Spanish. That's great, I'll take it from So so now uh, here's the here's Carolyn's film and that will conclude the talk.
He wrote that. And, and he sang all the, all the parts, too. He sang oh, all the parts. Oh, wow. His voice. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, he's quite something. It's a little common for you, right? Oh, yeah. Graduate. He's a graduate of Wilbury. And his parents, his parents taught, taught here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where is he now? I, he, he could be on the West Coast. Yeah. He's in, in theater and show business. And one other question. Way back when you talked about, was it Italian? Lace Italian something that was fabric Venetian Venetian or <coughs> Venetian oh. Venice or uh, no the plaster that I use is called Venetian plaster Venetian plaster how is it different uh, it it's not like plaster of Paris it's it's like slaked lime and it's it has the consistency of uh, concrete in a way a little a little easier to work and it's green so you can wash your hands in the sink afterwards mm -hmm. uh, which is a big thing <laughs> and uh, and it work and you can use it at varying uh, viscosities thick thin all you can paint with it you can mm -hmm. infuse color into it it seems to flow it it does flow it does oh. yes how heavy is a friend yes how heavy is one of those objects up there it looks light but uh, they are the the Female figures are very light. They're ex you, yes, they're very light for some reason. <laughs> the wall, no, it, it's chunky and heavy because it has a lot of wood and canvas and so forth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question. Mm -hmm. What's your history in Barcelona? What is the history that takes you to Barcelona? Oh, you really want to hear that story? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I had a friend, now deceased, an artist, uh, Ben Bianchi who um, one day, um, back in the 80s, decided he wanted to bring his friends um, to my house in New Jersey, uh, he, his friends from Barcelona who were themselves artists, to see, you know, sort of the natives in their habitat uh, <laughs> on July 4th. Uh, so, so we were having a cookout and the whole thing, and they came, and, um, and we just sort of fell in love. Uh, we just, you know, had so so much in common, and they said to me at that time, "You really should come to Barcelona and work in this etching studio." 
um, and had always wanted to make etchings. I'd done silk screen and lithograph uh, in printmaking, but um, I, I was a little timid about et uh, etching because you know there's acid and there's metal and you work on metal, and I, I don't know, I had a little bit of timidity. But eventually, some, it took me years actually, I screwed up my courage and I went to Barcelona and uh, walked into that studio and it was heaven. And lots of different artists use it. They do. They, um, there's a master printer there whose dad worked with uh, Miro, Picasso, mm. you know, all those prints that you see. It's quite a place. It's very funky, <laughs> you know, uh, in a way. Uh, but it's a place where people, you know, get dirty and work and uh, mm. so forth. Uh, Dolly has worked there. Joseph Boyce worked there. Um, now the uh, somewhat famous artist uh, Jaume Plenza works there now. Uh, he made the Crown Plaza Fountain in Chicago, if you know that uh, huge work. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, uh, an amazing place, kind of little known but amazing and um, they have these very large press beds, so that's how I can make those very large prints. Yes. And they were designed for tapiers, so, uh, and sort of made custom for him. So there they are, and we can use them. But so transporting those from Barcelona back here must mm -hmm. have been challenging. Well, the, they are rolled up, and, okay. and they come in, in big tubes. So that that tubes. part isn't so hard. It's a little expensive, but yeah. the figures to transport. Well, the figures you made here. Oh, oh, the figures. Were oh, you made them yeah. here? Yes, yes, they were made in my studio. Yeah, Good. that's what, that was my studio. You saw, uh, whenever you saw sculpture, it was my studio. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to say that right behind you are two carriages. Oh my! Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> there you have it. <coughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Girls on the march. And then behind you, uh, there's a poster from France that's similar to your inspiration. And there's one downstairs as really? well. Uh, it's like Columbia. Oh, yes, mm. Columbia. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the one book is showing here. It's a French poster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was very interested to read about Columbia because she is kind of a contemporary writer. Um, figure that, yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Kind of Aubrey Beardsley, but very, very uh, transmuted, heroic. Hmm. Not anti-war. Pardon? Not anti-war. Her, she, that figure seems, is yes. leading war. Yeah, Maybe. yes, charging well, Joan of Arc. Yeah. Yes. It's raising money for the war. Right. <laughs> right. There should be that could be bonds or whatever, you know, for the, for the flag, for victory. Yeah. Hmm. Hi, the, yes. Uh, thank you so much. That was just lovely. I love also the song of the music and mm -hmm. the poem together. Oh, thank it's you. Lovely. I have a, um, a question that kind of, might be kind of difficult to answer. I'm not sure how I want to ask it, but. The, in the poem, something that you read, you talked about um, what it was like to have an idea kind of appear and then impose itself on you. You know, the word impose was in that poem, how something won't, kind of won't let you go. Yes. Can you speak of that a little bit, what that process is like for you to have an idea and dive into it? Yeah, I, I mean, it, you can see how difficult, I was really trying to speak about that. You were uh, speaking about that. Uh, Something moves you as an artist, you know. Um, this is the way I work anyway. There are artists who work in other ways, I think. But ultimately, something comes to you. It, I mean, it's akin to a dream, but it's a mental, something happens in your mind. Shakespeare said, and then begins a voyage in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like that. Mm -hmm. And certain things do take you over and you say, yes, that has enough uh, vitality all by itself that I'm going to pursue it. It will carry me along. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it, it doesn't happen, but in this case, it certainly has. Yeah. 
I guess I, I you really got that across, but I, I think that there's that bridge between how um, strong your images are to take a, sort of an idea and then to be able to create that. There's a, a step that one needs to take to get there, which I think Yes, is, and that's um, about going into the studio mm -hmm. and hanging out um, and, and even being in a kind of void or in a state of... Like the first... The, fear. You know? The vague first line of that poem? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. yes. Which is empty and full. Yes. And, and you just... After a while, you, you trust that something is, is cooking. And you know, if you stay with it, it, it does. The muse does not abandon you if you meet the muse. Mm -hmm. you know? OK, thank you. Yeah, that's how I, I hope that. No, it's really hard. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's the thing I try to teach, not teach, but speak about with students. You know, when you are finding things incredibly difficult, and you're, you're just nervous as can be in the studio with nothing happening, you know you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a paradox. But thank you. It's happening. Theologians call it the hound of heaven. Yes. <laughs> yes. Being hounded. Really yes, you. yes. Hounded. I love that. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Fran, did you, forgive me, but I'm interested in how long um, Timing-wise, it took you to create this. This seems to have so many aspects to it. Yes. And how long a period of time did you work on it from your yeah. initial? Probably three years, off and on. And then, as I said, different artists joined in. There was also a, a performance of uh, Olivier Messiaen's um, Cantata for the End of Time, mm -hmm. I think it's called, which he wrote while he was a prisoner of war. And I think he had five instruments in the camp, and he wrote for those instruments. So it was very, uh, we were lucky to have Tanya Gabrielian as a pianist, got the musicians together and, pay, and played in the midst of the sculpture. So all these different events have happened around, around the piece. Uh, so, you know, I could say three years to, you know, to make the, the, um, the nuts and bolts pieces, but then other things uh, came in. And are there plans beyond this wonderful Shell's museum, but elsewhere that it? Not at the moment. No storage. Oh. <laughs> Responsible storage. Oh. It should it's, keep traveling. Yeah. It's an amazing. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, I realize we're not seeing all of it uh, due to the space limitations. It's but it's there though. It's, it is sufficient. It's really, really. It's sort of like poetry, you know. It can be very uh, abbreviated and still, you know. Also, Robert uh, Robert made the sound element that you hear. Um, it's a, a kind of a sound collage. So that's that was a new element that came in with this exhibition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Along with being in the midst of the larger exhibition, mm -hmm. which is oh, perfect. It's perfect. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, in looking at the figures as you're beginning the construction, am I yes. right that, that they are foam, uh, styrofoam yes. kind of? Some of them are, it's foam and wire and bandage and, and um, you know, anything that will make the structure very stable. And, and I failed in some areas of that. <laughs> oh. But, uh, and then the, the plaster and muslin that I could drape. Yes. That, that's that draping thing you see, which is almost like another kind of drawing. You mm -hmm. could sort of draw with mm -hmm. the fabric. And if I may, um, with the birds in the, in the film, that aspect of looking um, at what's sort of dripping off the birds, um, and how do you get that effect? You just that could have been the lighting in the film. It, it, you can see the actual birds here. Yes. And uh, they're, they're kind of sinister birds, I have to say. It was a sense of almost blood dripping Yes, off that's where I was leading no. in the film. To making it feel yeah. like it was, was blood. It wasn't was too. just feathers. It wasn't just me. No. <laughs> it didn't feel like just feathers. Was that film is, is really... Isn't it something? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Was Flanders, were Flanders fields um, pastures? Which yes. Is the sheep. Yes, and, and there were, you know, 
if you've been to that part of the world, the poppies are just come up in profusion. It was sort of, you know, this suggestion of mm -hmm. the, the soldiers um, who were buried there, mm -hmm. um, sprouting these mm -hmm. flowers. An amazing image. And it really, it was such a living image from the poet all the way through the making of the work. So you have these levels in nature in, in this work. You have the underground, which is where the soldiers are buried. You have the field of poppies. Then you have you know, the human activity as if on kind of a stage. And then above that, you have the, the birds in nature. You know, nature going on as best it can um, in the midst of, you know. So powerful, powerful. And we had our own sound effects with the app. The what rains? Oh, yeah. 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 Started the rain. Yeah. Right. Oh, it was the finished. Winter's right. coming. No, but it was the rain. rain hitting the air. Oh, hit it. Yeah. That's yeah. What that that was very powerful. Oh, that was powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd done that too. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Life and art. Yes, Megan. Um, I I was appreciating a, a couple things. One was what you were just describing, the many levels. It's like a there's a transmutation through the levels in terms of like life, the death of the soldiers, their bodies underground, and then the flowers growing from their bodies and the red of the the flower and the red of the blood that was yes. spilled. And then the you know, if one were to go here, a sense of like the invisible, the spirit or the soul of them above right with the birds yes there's just such a beautiful connection there with the transmutation between many nature levels like you were describing that was really lovely um, and then i i i wanted to just be curious i really appreciate the interdisciplinary aspect of the work so within your own uh, lexicon there's lots of media and then also the collaborative component yes. um, in terms of collaborating with other artists and inhabiting, again, more interdisciplinary um, media. I wonder if you could speak to that process, like, because it's, it's such a beautiful process and it's not, it's not easy. And so to find your path with it in this way where it synthesizes so well I'm wondering if you can speak to that or share a little bit. Yeah, particularly in this piece, I experienced um, the collaboration. And I sort of, my feeling is always to say yes to stuff. Somebody comes to you and says, wow, let's do blah, blah. Yeah, let's do it. And, and then something happens. So if you, if, you, you know, if you sort of dwell in your own reservations about you know, either working with somebody or, or, or that the idea might be so foreign to you, then nothing ever happens. <laughs> so I'm the fool who rushes in. And this is how a very harmonious collaboration happens. And that was, you know, with, with Eileen Blackman, when, we, um, when she proposed the dance, was, yes! Well, <laughs> and then we had some meetings and we found, you know, we just, had so much to um, speak about, and, and the exchange was great. And then she made the piece, and it was marvelous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's kind of my approach to collaboration. Uh, I don't always start out. I'm kind of, you know, as an artist in the studio in the old-fashioned way. I'm, you know, I'm a, a sort of a one-man band. But then when this this other stuff comes in, and I do have. You know, I do have uh, a background in music and um, in, in other aspects, in set design. Um, yeah, uh, I, it, it's wonderful to have all of these things operate. And especially in this piece, it happened. And so when you're cultivating that, right, there's an openness I'm hearing and a receptivity. Yes, and a conversation yes. And, um, and a a letting go, like you're exactly. on a ride and an adventure, in a sense. Yeah, I'm feeling. I mean, I'm curious. Did what? Did you know? Well, did you see, for example, like the dance piece? Did you see that happen before it occurred, or was it kind of a surprise when it all came together? I never saw a rehearsal. Um, it was a total surprise. 
But we had had these conversations, and I just had trust that something amazing was going to happen. And it did. You know, it's just so, you know, just so happened, it did. And of course, Eileen is, you know, another kindred soul in, in creating and improvising and um, so forth. So it was, it was very fruitful. Thank you. What music did she use for that? <coughs> What music did she use? She used the Messian. Oh, she did? Yes, cantata for the end of time. It's a difficult piece, mm -hmm. but it is. It so, may not be cantata for the end of time, Some, but it's like that. Yeah. I seem to remember it's basically a string quartet and one other instrument, I think. Kind of like that, yes. Yeah. And, and very yes. agonized. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. With movements. Five with movements. Bird sound, but, but with bird sounds. Yes. Because he yeah. wrote that. And there was a flute, I believe. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. There should be a flute. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.